So it's a great pleasure for me, me to be involved in this teaching video. Uh, my name is Professor Brian Saunders. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist at St. Mark's Hospital in London and Professor of Endoscopy Practice at Imperial College London. Now I've had experience of using the endocuff for the last eight years and the endocuff vision uh, I've performed probably over 4,000 procedures using it. So I have a lot of experience at using the, the device and we, I want to try and get that across to you in this teaching video. Good morning, my name is uh, Andrea Parcher. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here in this uh, endocuff session at Olympus this morning. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist in a clinic in the northern part of Germany, in the Münster. Um, I'm the head of the clinic, I'm a specialized endoscopist and uh, we're using in the clinic since a couple of years the endocuff, now the endocuff vision. The, uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk about a little bit what the advantages of endocuff uh, is also for the daily routine um, in our colonoscopy patients. What is our goal? Our goal is uh, to prevent colon cancer. So when we do screening or surveillance colonoscopies, uh, there has been a fair amount of work on uh, finding techniques and uh, finding new solutions to um, get a better results on our uh, measure of quality. What is our measure of quality? Our measure of quality is here the normal detection rate and uh, the endocuff vision has been shown to maximize this uh, ADR, so the uh, adenoma detection rate, as well as the polyp detection rates. Um, so um, it is for our daily work uh, in uh, experienced uh, colonoscopists, I think it's uh, something that um, enhances our results and uh, makes our works uh, on, on our patients uh, to find or to prevent colon cancer. Uh, uh, it's uh, something that uh, is for sure positive for us. Um, we're going to uh, show you today a little bit uh, how to handle the endocuff vision. First of all, also how to place it on the uh, scope. Uh, you can see um, here uh, in front of me that uh, we have different endocuff vision types. Uh, there are different colors. What do the colors mean? The colors they mean nothing else than different sizes, so you can place them on different types of uh, colonoscopes, so you can also use it for, for example, for uh, a colonoscope that you use for uh, pediatric patients. Um, and so you have to fit for the right scope, you fit the right color. I show you now how to place uh, an endocuff vision on the endoscope. You see that it's uh, packed in a, a single pack, and uh, you actually open it and don't take it out yet. You take the endoscope and you place it, um, the tip of the endoscope, you place inside the endocuff vision. You then take it out, and that's very important now, to push it back all the way that when you have the endoscopic image, you don't see any border in any rim of the endocuff vision. Then you're sure that it's uh, uh, placed right and is fixed on the colonoscope. One of the things that people are always very worried about with the cuff is that it'll come off, it'll, it'll detach. Uh, and when you're busy in the endoscopy environment, it's very easy to forget to push the endocuff right onto the tip of the uh, of the endoscope. You should see no endocuff at all at the end. If you can see endocuff, there is a risk that um, it's not securely enough on the tip and it might detach. And you have to be particularly careful in patients who have very strong uh, anal sphincter uh, who are relatively lightly sedated. Um, so always double check, the endo endoscopist should do this before you insert the scope, you can see no endocuff. With the uh, endocuff on the endoscope, I lay the endoscope out uh, just on, on the uh, patient uh, 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 trolley and perform a gentle rectal examination with plenty of lubrication. And then as I take the index finger out from doing the rectal examination, the digital rectal examination, I insert the endocuff, the scope with the endocuff on the end alongside so that you guide the instrument in uh, through the center of the anal canal. The endocuff does increase the diameter of the tip of the endoscope and it is slightly ridged. So 
this is potentially uh, an uncomfortable moment for the patient. You can really reduce that by good lubrication and by doing that, that technique of guiding the tip of the colonoscope as the index finger is with, withdrawn. The anal canal varies in length quite considerably and some patients will have anal, can have anal pathology which slightly distorts the anal canal. And in that case, um, forcible pushing can be a bad thing to do, particularly when you've got an endocuff on and can be uncomfortable. So it's much better to use the, the finger and guide the, the direction of insertion. Yeah, I don't have a lot of comments to do with that. I do it actually very similar. One question I would have, Brian, um, do you put um, the lubrificant on the scope or is it enough for you to do the digital examination with the lubrificant and then you just wetten the scope with water? That's what I do. I don't put any lubrificant uh, uh, additionally on the scope. I do it when, my, when I do the uh, rectal examination and then I wetten the scope with water and usually that's more than enough to get a gentle insert in the anal canal. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, so, so, I mean, if you, you'll have lubricated doing, uh, with the finger doing the digital rectal examination. So it's relatively straightforward then just to, just to put the endocuff scope o over the top. Um, the, it's easy in some patients, if they're particularly, if they're, if they have a slightly, if they're older or they have a slightly weaker anal sphincter in younger patients, uh, with high anal tone, you have to be quite careful not to cause discomfort at that point. What, what, what is your, um, in your uh, patient, do you also have a lot of outpatients or do you also have a lot of patients that have like a light sedation and maybe not that deep sedation that you use uh, when you have like uh, uh, procedures in the hospital? I think this is a major thing, how to handle it. I mean, I, I work in the hospital, I have also outpatients, but uh, there is a little bit of a difference uh, how to uh, make the sedation in uh, uh, inward and outward uh, patients. How do you handle that? I mean, we, we use a sort of tailored approach where where we ask the patients. Some patients don't want any sedation; they want to be completely awake for the procedure, and that's that's absolutely fine. But in those patients, particularly, they're going to have higher anal tone, and they're going to set, potentially be more sensitive during the insertion. So you have to be aware of that. At the other end of the spectrum, some of my patients will have propofol. If they have prof propofol, it's really not 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 a problem at all. Um, some patients just just a small amount of fentanyl um the majority will either have nothing or have propofol uh it's sort of you know it's uh it's almost an all or nothing with sedation but we let patients decide what what what, what they want propofol is so short acting it's very useful because you can you can have quite heavy sedation during the initial insertion phase and then the patient is awake during withdrawal is also useful during the insertion phase uh, of the procedure. And of course, because the arms of the cuff are out of the field of view, you can't really see what it's doing, but it is actually a great assistance um, during insertion. Now, nowadays with the, the washing pump at the end, we can use water very freely. And I think most uh, colonoscopists have moved over to a, a water exchange uh, or water immersion technique, particularly for insertion through the sigmoid. But what the cuff does is that as you gradually fill the sigmoid with water and creep forward using very small lateral or up and down movements to find the lumen, the cuff helps to keep the uh, lumen of the, uh, the, the mucosa uh, uh, in the sigmoid away from the tip uh, of the uh, scope so that you can still see and locate where the lumen is. So here, as we go through the sigmoid, I'm infusing water continuously. And every now and again, we're pausing, we're suctioning any gas pockets, and I'm pulling back slightly at times just to help straighten the sigmoid. And with that, you can often keep the sigmoid relatively straight with easy passage into the descending colon um, and fairly rapidly pass uh, along the, the, the left side of, of the bowel. Um, you can't see what the arms are doing, but they are helping just to concertina the sigmoid back and, and straighten the, uh, the, the, the sigmoid uh, to ease passage. And of course, if you can keep a, a straight sigmoid, then the rest of the procedure is relatively straightforward. So, so Andrea, are, are you using a similar type of technique? What's your experience going through the sigmoid? 
Yeah, that was actually a very nice demonstration how to straighten the signal. Um, I think the water injection technique, uh, especially since we have the uh, endowater jet, is something that we really use in almost all the patients. Um, maybe on, on, on this part also, I'm sure that you have also a lot of uh, trainee and uh, young endoscopists that uh, work with you. Um, are they teached really to use the uh, end of water jet already in, in their training program is, or is it something that should be done by uh, really uh, experienced endoscopists? No, the, the trainees, uh, they're, they're taught uh, insertion with, with water. Uh, in fact, it makes the insertion easiest and they find it quite easy to adapt to. Um, I don't, do you turn the carbon dioxide off? Do you, do you turn it off? I, I personally don't but I try to absolutely minimize the use of any carbon dioxide. We don't use room air any, anymore for obvious reasons. Um, but but uh, I don't actually turn the carbon dioxide off, but our trainees adapt to it very quickly. The, the, the buscopan question, the reason that people are worried about buscopan is they perceive that it might make the colon longer or sort of... Um, but the brilliant thing with the cuff is that the cuff allows you to straighten any degree of looping. So I'm not concerned about that. I'd rather have the anti-spasm properties and be able to steer accurately through the sigmoid. So that's why I give buscopan early on in the procedure. With the cuff on, even if the proximal colon is a bit longer than it would have been uh, normally, you can control that with, with the cuff uh, and straightening maneuvers. And in fact, I think we've got another video to come on to which demonstrates that. In this case, uh, there is an obvious end loop you can see on the uh, scope guide imager. And the advantage with the cuff is that it's relatively easy to straighten loops because as we pull back, uh, the arms of the cuff engage at the tip and anchor the tip, giving you more purchase to allow torque and withdrawal to really straighten that loop. And then keeping the torque once you start to push forward forces transmitted with the straight scope through the tip. The arms then de detach from the, from the bow wall, light will lie at the side of the scope, and you can then progress and move forward. Once you do that, and you can see that on the scope guide, do you rotate the scope or is it a straight uh, maneuver? It's, it's a combination of clockwise twist in that end, end loop and withdrawal. And then at the point of reinsertion, once the scope is straight, keeping a slight clockwise warp. That transmits force through the, through the shaft of the endoscope towards the tip um, and allows uh, forward movement of the tip. Um, but it, often at several different points during the, the colonoscopy, there's a slight degree of looping, but I'm, it's much easier to control loops with the, with the cuff. If I have a patient who I know has got a really long and mobile colon, I will always use the cuff because it's so much easier to control the uh, uh, looping and straighten the instrument. And in fact, um, patients who previously have needed double balloon colonoscopy, now I can scope uh, with, with the cuff because I can control those loops uh, going forward. Another, uh, maybe another question too, because um, it wasn't very clear, I think, uh, in the video. Do you have in your experience when you do this maneuver do you have to see the branches the arms of the endocuff or you know what we, we we see that you can hold yourself better with the endocuff but you don't see in the video the arms i don't think it's important to see them because of course you feel it that you you're in the middle of a uh, um, of the colon and you can retrieve you withdraw your endoscope to straighten it um and I get often the question, oh, but you don't see the arms. Are you really sure that you're uh, you're holding yourself, basically? Yeah, I, I mean, actually, on the video, you did briefly see the arms at, at one point, um, but um, obviously, that that uh, most of that action is occurring behind the the, the lens, so you may, you may not uh, see that entirely. Um, but um, the taking gas out and bringing the the wall onto the tip of the scope uh, helps at that point as well. So from the tip, um, re reducing any, any gas pockets uh, to, to deflate the colon and in, uh, engage the, the, the cuff more will give you more purchase. But you still have to apply 
obviously clockwise torque or anti-clockwise depending on the particular loop and the, the the scope guide system brings that to life most of the time when i'm withdrawing a, a large loop i'm actually looking mainly at the scope guide um uh, just glancing at the endoscopic view to make sure we're not slipping back So in this situation, or if you look at the uh, scope guide imager, you can see we've passed around to the proximal transverse colon, um, but there's a little bit of uh, looping occurring uh, and we're trying to get around the hepatic flexure to pass down into the ascending. Now at this point, um, as we push forward, um, there's a deep transverse looping, but if we get up to the the main bend and then engage the endocuff, we can pull back to open up the fold and then pass around the hepatic flexure down into the ascending colon. And there's the cecum coming into view with that typical question mark appearance on the image of you and the, the appendix orifice. Brian, can I ask you, um, this is often the situation where we ask our assistants to put some pressure from outside so we can we can do exactly what you just did. Uh, in your experience, does also the application of the endocuff vision uh, minimizes the pressure we need from outside? So are you more, uh, do, you, do you need as often the assistance as you used to uh, do without the endocuff vision? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, my, certainly my impression that the number of times you need to position change or use abdominal pressure is significantly reduced. Yeah, I can absolutely. It's actually also my experience. I think it, it's a very relative point. So in, 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 the, in the last in video case, uh, if I hadn't have been able to use the cuff to go around the hepatic, I would have used deep transverse pressure with the assistant pressing low in the tummy in the ab low in the abdomen pushing upwards um, but in this case it wasn't necessary because we've got extra purchase and manipulation of the colon with the with the cuff from the tip so andrea we've, we've got to got to the cecum do you go into the terminal ileum in every single patient yes yes um for two reasons first of all um I think it's very important. I do a lot of trainee. I have uh, a lot of uh, trainee in, in, in my clinic. And uh, the only way to learn it when you really need it, that it you do it on a routine basis. Um, the second point is that uh, we have a pretty big uh, IBD uh, cohort of patients. So as you know, that's uh, actually mandatory that we look at the terminal island. Um, so it's, uh, I, I really try uh, to teach that we do it in every colonoscopy, yes. And uh, so with the cuff, more difficult, less difficult? What's your impression? What I would say, it is, of course, one of the most challenging things when you learn to do a colonoscopy to insert the uh, uh, terminal island. I think that the, the techniques and the tricks that you learn in a colonoscopy without the endocuff, if you use that then with the endocuff, actually, I don't see any problems with the endocuff. So what we need to do is we have to be sure where is the entrance of the terminal island? We have to, and this I think, and this is the first thing I learned from my first endoscopy teacher, never try to insert the terminal island when you really had a, lo a lot of air, a lot of CO2 in the cecum, because of course um, you straighten the cecum and then the, the tension on the cecal valve is too high. So the first thing I always teach is go in the cecum, take the air out, take the CO2 out, be sure where you are, and if you're not sure, go back a little bit um, and look at the really the point where you want to go in. And I personally, in my experience with the, with the endocuff, is that with the branches you can really go on one of the of the rims of the lips of the sacral valve, and you can kind of open it up for you. I, in my experience, after you do it, of course, uh, um, in a certain amount uh, of patient. I don't, I don't uh, encounter more problems than without. Maybe if you know how to do it, it's even uh, um, something that can help you go inside the terminal island. I don't know what your experience about it is. Yeah, I, initially I thought it was slightly more difficult to get into the terminal ileum. Um, 
certainly more slightly more difficult than if you have a cap, a, a plastic cap. But um, you can always get you can always get into the term lilium if you want to. What is more difficult is deep uh, term lilium in Chibok. Um, but we would want to get into the term lilium to photo document to practice it for when you really need it. Um, so uh, if we can show the video now, there's uh, a, quite a useful trick that you can use, which is water insertion. So in this video, you can see that we're clearly in the cecum, and um, I've already removed one little polyp in the cecal pole. I'm trying to get into the terminal ileum initially, just using a standard technique, and the cuff is slightly restricting the ability to get into the into the uh, uh, terminal ileum. So I'm using a trick of water uh, in immersion, where we take the gas out and we use water instead to just open up the lips of the valve. And it then becomes much easier for the cuff uh, to pass into the terminal ileum. And you can see with narrowband imaging, the villi, and uh, there with, uh, with white light as well. So it's a useful tip. It's mainly just that you're decompressing. You're taking the pressure off from, from air by decompressing taking the air out and infusing with water. But it's a useful trick if you're struggling with the cuff to get into the terminal ileum. I, very nice demonstration, Brian. What do you think, what, what do you think of, of the ch the having, the, having the chance of really sitting there and try to kind of open it with the, with the endocuff? I think this is something that uh, it's really, uh, you, you're really able to do with the endocuff, that you once you know exactly where to go in, you can kind of open it up, of course, with the water insertion. It was a very nice demonstration. You can do it, I think, also without. Yes, the the it's a bit like pressing into the inside bend, which uh, during withdrawal to open up the fold, you're opening up the the proximal lip of the eyelid sequel valve with the arm of the cuff, um, and you can often just just get into the tip of the terminal eyelid very quickly doing that. But as I say, it becomes more difficult then to get deep insertion. I think uh, if if I was wanting to do a, you know, examine 30, 40 centimeters of the terminal ileum, uh, I, for a, for suspected inflammatory bowel disease, I might prefer to use use the cap rather than the cuff in that context. So people are often worried about whether or not you can retroflex with the cuff on, and the answer is almost always you can, um, obviously in the rectum, but also in the right colon. So here, this is using um, an, a pediatric scope. I've retroflexed in the cecum. And then in that retroflex position, you can actually pull right back to the hepatic flexure. And you get a very unique view of the proximal colon by doing that. Um, the cuff, the arms of the cuff, as you retroflex, uh, fold back alongside the tip of the scope, so they're not impeding anything or causing any problem. But like all retroflexion, if for some reason it's not reflect, re retroflexing easier, never use force. It is potentially da dangerous, any form of retroflexion. So if it's going easily, then continue. But the cuff itself does not impede the ability to retroflex. Um, Brian, let me ask you something on the retroflexion, especially in the right colon. I think uh, you're right, it is possible, but uh, I see that many colleagues have problems in that and are also maybe a little bit afraid of doing that, especially if they're not experienced. Isn't the uh, application of the endocuff on your endoscope uh, a way maybe to avoid the uh, retroflexion in, in, in the way that you, can, you have a better view of the cecum and uh, behind the folds? Andrea, I think it's a very, it's a very good point. Um, the whole point with the endo cuff is that you've got a, got this improved forward view, so you don't have to retroflex. In fact, you don't really have to retroflex in the in the rectum many times either. Um, but the point I was trying to make with that is that in a in a quite a high percentage of patients, you can still retroflex if you want to, uh, and it can be very useful to do that. Uh, see the proximal side of folds, and you can pull the scope right back to the hepatic flexure, sometimes right back to the transverse colon. Um, seeing the proximal side, uh, but if it's if it's at all difficult, if it's not going, don't don't uh, force the issue. Use the arms 
uh, in the forward view uh, to get those good views. So here we are just coming back from the cecum and you can see clearly that there's a, a small polyp here. What do you, what do you feel, what, what do you think are the uh, most uh, uh, striking advantages uh, in therapeutic colonoscopy using the endocuff? So the tip stability uh, provides you with optimal access, which means that you can deliver the therapy more effectively and in a quicker time and in, and in a more controlled way. Talking about the endocuff, I mean, that it has two advantages, maybe not in this polyp, but if you do polypectomy once, of course, you, you can hold your position better. But how many times do you really need a cap? Do you, do you still need a cap? Do, do you have like the situation where the endocuff is not good enough and you have to go back and really put a mucosa cap or put another device on your scope? In my experience, it's really very seldom. Yeah, very, very seldom. I mean, you only really need the cap if you're using a knife or uh, you're expecting the risk of significant bleeding um, that needs to be that could need to be controlled. Uh, but almost all routine polypectomy, I would use the endocuff. And the the brilliant thing about it is it, it stabilizes the tip, so that your your efficiency in doing the polypectomy is enhanced. It's you're quicker. You re, it's easier to retrieve the specimen, uh, your position is more stable. All therapy is basically quite straightforward as long as you've got good access. And what the cuff does, it, it enables that, ac that ac access and makes it easier. This is just showing some of the, the different uh, imaging modalities on the new uh, um, uh, X1 uh, scopes. Uh, that was briefly showing uh, dichromatic imaging RDI which helps to locate any specific bleeding points. Of course, after a cold snare, you're not expecting any bleeding, but it's quite useful sometimes just to look at it with RDI, um, just to ensure that there's no arterial uh, bleeding occurring. Um, TXI is more for, for um, examination of the mucosa and identification of lesions, uh, but you can seamlessly flip from one to another uh, during the procedure. But the cuff, what the cuff is doing is it's just enhancing the view and allowing you to then bring in the other modalities. Well, let me ask you, uh, Brian, um, if a patient is referred to your hospital to your, and you make the endoscopy, you know from the colleague that is referring the patient that uh, uh, the patient has a, a pretty big flat lesion in a cecum, how do you prepare your scope? You prepare your scope like we did it like uh, in... Uh, uh, times before with a cap, or you, do you prepare your scope with the endocuff? Um, almost always with a cap, uh, simply because if there's any uh, ileocecal valve involvement, um, you may need to work in and around the valve, and it's much easier to do that with, with the cap. Uh, obviously, the cap also gives you, the, gives you the option of using a knife for either ESD or uh, a sort of hybrid procedure. So I generally use the cap. Occasionally, uh, particularly in the hepatic flexure area or the distal ascending colon, actually the cuff is more useful because it's better at holding back the folds when you when you want access onto, onto the polyp. But if it's in the sneaker, I generally use, use, use a cap. So one of the big advantages with the endocuff is coming back through the proximal colon where you can use the scope to push the cuff into the side wall and open up the inside bend uh, of, of folds whilst maintaining visualization. And you'll see intermittently the cuff arms coming into the field of view when they deploy to hold the fold back. And you can move backwards and forwards, but generally your, the amount of backwards and forwards movement is reduced. Therefore, the withdrawal is much smoother and more efficient. Talking about efficiency, are you also faster in the withdrawal using the endocuff? Y yes, significantly faster. Um, in fact, um, sometimes, you know, almost bang on six minutes. Whereas before, if you don't use the cuff, we're up at around, you know, 10 to 12 minutes to do a good examination. The cuff just gives you such a good view at various different uh, times it, it, during the procedure 
that your withdrawal is much more progressive. It's sort of slower and controlled and more progressive, but you're not having to go constantly backwards and forwards and fight with the fold the way you are if you haven't got the device on the tip. There's a, there, there are publications coming through now which show a much more um, uh, effective uh, withdrawal and a quicker withdrawal with the endocuff with no loss of quality. Uh, in fact, higher adenoma detection rates with a quicker withdrawal. We've actually proposed a new metric for um, uh, assessing quality and efficiency at colonoscopy called the SP6, which is the number of um, significant polyps, i.e. sesulcerated polyps or adenomas, removed um, in a six minute period. And that, what that does is it, it's, it allows you to compare different devices and different modalities and show which um, allows you to be more effective at the entire procedure, not just at picking up adenomas, which is just one part of, uh, of, of the colonoscopy quality process, looking at all significant polyps and putting a time metric on there to show whether you're eff effective or not. And in a recent publication in GI endoscopy, uh, using the endocuff compared to standard colonoscope without the cuff, we were something like three times more time effective. So this is where the cuff really has a very obvious advantage coming back through the left colon. Um, the left colon is a little bit, bit narrower than the right colon. So the arms of the cuff can deploy completely to open out the folds and allow that very controlled withdrawal, keeping the tip of the scope pretty much in the center of the lumen. And then if the cuff works in tandem with the washing pump, you can wash a little and clear any debris um, and just very gentle, slight backward movements, just giving that panoramic view of the entire sigmoid um, really speeds the withdrawal process. Without the cuff, that would be collapsed. The folds would be very prominent and difficult to see around uh, and very easy to miss polyps on the proximal side of folds. With the cuff, it's opened out. Um, it's much easier and much more controlled. And then if you do see a polyp, it's easier to stop have a stable position and remove the polyp. We all thought we were afraid of uh, missing polyps in the right colon and uh, the endocuff was, was good to uh, default uh, the folds in the, in the right colon. If you see this video, I think endocuff is in the left colon, as important as it is in the right colon. And one thing that you can see very good in this video is not only how it keeps it open and you can see behind the folds, but the scope is always in the middle of the colon. And I think this is something that is extremely important and you can really do that with the endocuff. I think that's a very beautiful video to show that. So here, here we're back in the sigmoid colon and uh, I've encountered quite a large uh, polyp in the mid sigmoid, which is uh, quite an unstable uh, place because the, obviously the sig sig sigmoid colon is free on its mesentery. But with the cuff, we anchor the position very nicely. You can just see the arms of the cuff deploying there allowing injection and then uh, subsequently snaring, um, snare positioning and diathermy. And what's nice about the cuff, because you have that stable position, um, we're much more confident at this point of, of cutting, knowing that if there's a problem with the polypectomy, I can deal with it very quickly and promptly. And the, 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 the main issue here would be if there was sudden arterial bleeding after the resection, in which case we've got stable access to put clips on or use diathermy. In this particular instance, I haven't quite removed all of the polyp. There's a tiny bit on the edge, but because we've got that stable position, it's very, very easy and quick just to redeploy the snare, um, capture that final piece of, of polyp, remove it, um, and then secure the position with, with the, the defect with clips to ensure there's no de delayed bleeding, but all because of that stable access onto the polypectomy base. Good to show that like this, I think, Brian, because you can see that even if you have a problem during the polypectomy, you stay uh, pretty stable there and you still have the chance. I mean, this is not perfect for a polypectomy, I agree, but this is perfect for the position and you don't lose your position. Imagine you would have done it without the, the polypectomy is not total and then you have to find your position, you stay there. And um, I, I, I think that's a great advantage of the endocuff, what you just showed. Yeah. 
So, 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 and, and Andrea, you, we're back in the rectum now. What's your uh, standard approach to examining the the, the, the rectum? Well, um, actually, we used to uh, always put a cap on the uh, endoscope to uh, examine the lower rectum and the anal canal. We don't do that anymore since we routinely use the endocuff because it really um, has the advantage to, to, to really open it up and uh, to give us uh, almost in every patient a good view to the, to the lower rectum. So um, the, the chance of missing uh, polyps in that region of the colon, I think, uh, it's uh, uh, not anymore uh, what we fear. Um, what do you think of um, having the endocuff on? Do you still do the uh, retroflexion in the rectum? Do you need that? Uh, is it even technically possible? Is it feasible? Yeah, I think uh, the, f the forward view uh, and the retroflex view are complementary. And um, generally, w uh, I would do both. Um, it is, it's, it's perfectly uh, straightforward to retroflex with the cuff on um, in the vast majority of rectums. But you, with the cuff, you also get that added advantage of the forward view uh, with the arms splayed, seeing the, the dentate line. But I think the two views are fairly complementary. It is easy to miss things in the rectum. Um, and another advantage, which will be shown in the video, is that um, in, in the video, we're retrieving the, the large polyp that I removed earlier on. And um, when it's captured within the net or by the snare, having the cuff on the end, it just helps to open the anal canal um, and ease the passage of the polyp out of the, out of the rectum uh, through the anal canal. So advantages uh, in terms of retrieval with the cuff. So, so Andrea, um, we've mentioned all the very positive points about the cuff. Is are there times when you wouldn't use it? Well, um, if we um, know the patient and we do a ray colonoscopy and we know already that uh, the patient can have strictures, can have like uh, um, uh, some problems in the colon that uh, could uh, make it difficult to pass the stricture, to pass a part of the colon, of course, we wouldn't use it from the beginning. Uh, moreover, in uh, patients where we, uh, we do a colonoscopy in IBD patients, when we know that uh, there are um, Crohn's disease uh, structures, Crohn's disease problems, or, or really a, a, a like inflammation and, and colitis, for example, uh, there's also another uh, mm, group of patients where we wouldn't routinely use uh, the endocuff. It's another question, for example, if you do a screening colonoscopy um, in a patient in remission with a colitis. Uh, I know that it's, uh, we always say don't use it in IBD patients. In this kind of patients where I know from the clinic that the patient is in a, in a good remission, uh, and has a colitis, and we're looking for polyps, we're looking for dysplasia. I would rather use it than not use it. Uh, you still have the chance to go back and uh, put it off. So I think the limitations are really um, inflammation, strictures, uh, and uh, I, I don't see any other problems. So why not to use it? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree very strongly with you about inflammatory bowel disease. The um, the as long as the, the the patient doesn't have active colitis. The benefit you get with the cuff is immense in terms of uh, looking for dysplasia, uh, looking for subtle abnormalities. In fact, I'd say it's, it's, it, it's probably more impactful than using dye spray or, or other techniques, simply because it enables you to manage fluid and residue well. It allows you to uh, have that panoramic view. Sometimes when you've got some sort of sticky mucus almost on the surface of the bowel, just withdrawing with the arms deployed helps to clear that mucus and the cuff in tandem with the washing pump, particularly if the washing pumps at a reasonable pressure, allows you to clear and see very, very clearly. So I, I would always use it routinely in quiescent colitis for, for surveillance. The, the only other thing I would add is if, if patients are known to have anal pathology, you have to be qu quite careful. Um, uh, if they have an anal stenosis or if they have uh, an anal fissure, obviously you've got to be careful because it's, it does widen the tip of the scope and, and could potentially cause trauma or be uncomfortable. So, uh, but the, the contraindications are very small, uh, but it is important to be aware of them. And it's also important that 
if you have one of those um, patients with a fixed uh, angulated sigmoid to realize it's quite okay to stop and take it off if, it, if you're not winning. But uh, Brian, since this is one of uh, our yeah, most frequent uh, pathologies, let's call it pathologies in the colon, we see it's a diverticular disease. Do you see any problems of using it in patients with diverticular disease? So would you, uh, you know, what you expect in a patient that's 75, 80 years old, you expect diverticular disease. Um, is it a problem? Would you still use it from the beginning? I would I would tend to use a pediatric scope with the cuff in that context, um, electively from the start. So you're using a narrow narrow diameter scope anyway. Um, most diverticular disease, the cuff is not is not a problem. In fact, it's a big advantage during withdrawal because you get that smooth muscle hypertrophy and slight narrowing in the sigmoid, which the cuff allows you to open out and get good views during the withdrawal phase. But of course, there is, there is a small percentage of patients with severe diverticular disease where even a pediatric scope is not going to be effective and you need to use a gastroscope or an alternative imaging technique. So no, there's, there's never one size fits all. Uh, it's all about tailoring your approach to the patient. But the vast majority, the cuff, um, either on pediatric instrument or adult instrument is, uh, is optimal in terms of visualization. Talking about the problems with endocuff, um, in a very small percentage, you, you lose the endocuff during the colonoscopy. The way you put it on the scope, or is it the anal canal that is uh, the problem? Where do you see the problem? I think you're talking about um, where the cuff falls off. It's happened to me twice. I've done about 4,000 procedures now. The first time, the cuff was not on correctly. And I I'd, I'd basically just, I hadn't checked that the cuff was, was definitely on. So you must do that meticulously every time. The second time was in a, in a patient who was lightly sedated, who had a degree of anal stenosis. And I kind of, I recognized that when I did the rectal examination, but I pressed on and uh, there was tight anal tone and a narrowing in, 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 in the anus during withdrawal and the cuff did uh, uh, detach. If that happens, um, generally the thing to do is to use uh, a retrieval net or a grasping forceps and usually you can, you can uh, pull, the, uh, pull the cuff out. Um, if the patient is sedated, you to increase the sedation just to relax, the, the anal tone can be useful as well. And both both times when it did deploy, I was able to to remove it uh, with with the retrieval net. How about you? Have you have you had? The, it's an unpleasant experience, but it, uh, it because the cuff is deformable, it will come out. Actually, uh, taking it out, I think exactly, it's not a big problem. Uh, it happened to. Me, it's funny. It happened also twice uh, with me, and it was uh, both times in a young patient uh, where they had a really strong and I think uh, anal tonus. And uh, I lost it digging the endoscope out. But I think it is very important to really make the point that it's very, very rare that it happens. Because as you, as you know, as, uh, from our experience, there are a lot of uh, um, endoscopies where when you use a cap, you, you, you put an extra fixation of the cap not to, use, not to lose it. I think this is something we absolutely shouldn't do with the, with the endocuff because it is stable on the endoscope and it is really something that happens very rarely. When you sometimes you've retrieved your, you've taken a small polyp off and you're trying to retrieve it and you can't, you can't see it in the suction trap and you, you give up on the polyp. When you take the cuff out, always have a look underneath the arms and around the tip of the cuff because often the polyp is actually lodged at that point and you can still retrie have retrieved the polyp. That's much better to look at that and to look at the one and a half liters of suction fluid to see if the polyp is in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brian is uh, <laughs> is actually the author of the evidence of endocuff. I think we have uh, we're doing evidence based medicine, and I think that our days, that's what we are supposed to do. And I think that now for the endocuff, we have a fair amount of uh, of good evidence to show that also in uh, randomized studies it shows uh, advantages uh, with the advantages we talked about. So it's not just our feeling of experienced endoscopists to use it, but it's really. 
also uh, something that is uh, evidence-based uh, uh, by now. I think that's a very important point. And uh, that's also a very important point. I don't know, Brian, we don't want to talk uh, about costs today, but it's also a very important point in our discussion with reimbursement of something like this. And uh, once you have the evidence, uh, uh, you should also you know, be aware that uh, it's something that should be used for all the patients that underwent screening colonoscopies. And uh, this is a discussion we still have, as at least in Germany. I don't know how it is uh, uh, in Great Britain. Yes, um, after after an analysis of the data uh, on our NICE group, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, um, cr uh, created guidance on the use of the cuff. And as a result of that, it was actually made free within the National Health Service within the UK. Uh, there is a small cost attached to it. Yeah, so recent, so recent studies have shown that the cuff makes the procedure uh, more efficient in terms of time and significant pathology uh, detected and treated and removed uh, and this uh, you know is going to be really impactful particularly in a, in a covid era when we really need to make sure that we direct our colonoscopy service um, to patients who most need it and to when we perform colonoscopy to be most effective um, in delivering cancer prevention which is what it's what it's really all about um, what i find is if i'm if I'm doing a list of colonoscopies, if I use the cuff, um, I get less tired because I'm having to do less in the way of manipulation of the scope tip. The withdrawal is smoother and, and more controlled. And actually fatigue and operator um, imperfection is, is probably the main reason why uh, lesions are missed uh, uh, resulting ultimately in post-colonoscopy colorectal cancers, which are a tragedy. So if you can be more effective in what you do and spend more focused time looking at more of the mucosa, then you're gonna be much more efficient and give better cancer prevention. And there's really, really clear evidence now that the more efficient you are, the more adenomas you detect, particularly in that screening population, the more effectively you will, you will protect your population from cancer in the long term. So it's been an absolute pleasure um, sh sharing a, a virtual podium uh, with, with Andrea. Um, uh, we uh, thoroughly appreciate the opportunity to uh, get these teaching points, very important teaching points across about, about the endocuff and its use. And we hope that this will be allow you to use the device more effectively in the future. It was my pleasure, Brian. Um, you're the one giving us the evidence to use it, uh, one of the main actors in this field. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure to join the session. Thank you.